Welcome to Life Point Church. We're so grateful that you've chosen to spend this time with us today as we come together to learn, worship, and grow as one family in faith. We hope that wherever you are, the message reaches you. Enjoy the service. Life Point Church, let's stand and worship. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaken.
Look what you've done How could you fall so far? You should be ashamed of yourself So I was ashamed of myself The lies I believed They got some roots that run deep I let it take a hold of my life I let it take control of my life in your presence, Lord, I can feel you digging all the roots up. I feel you healing all my wounds up. All I can say is hallelujah. Look what you've done. Look what you've done in me. You spoke your truth into the lies and let my heart believe. Look at me now. Look how you made me do.
Within the chaos, how you sustain us. Breath of heaven within our lungs, a new sound stirring. Sounds like how great you name. Praise the bride of Judah, oh, praise the Lamb once slain. We just love to welcome you and give you your next steps on your journey here at LifePoint Church because this is something that we do together. Enjoy the service. Good morning, LifePoint. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I love that song. I love to give worship towards God and who he is. Uh, Let's give a hand clap. I'm just so thankful for who God is. We love him. Um, If you are here with us today, maybe this is your first time, I want to personally thank you. Um, I just want to say something. We are in the last part of our sermon series on being blessed. I really think you're going to be blessed by today and what God has in store. Please take a look at the video. Gratitude. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not some nostalgic or wistful memory of what has been or some nebulous hope of what might be. It's not a fair weather friend that draws close to you in the summer and then abandons you in the winter. It's not dependent on circumstances or only for warm, fuzzy moments. Gratitude, after all, is a choice, an act of the will where we place ourselves completely in God's will, no matter what happens, a determination to hope in the Lord in the midst of both happiness and sorrow, to give thanks for the good things he has given and the good things he has taken away, an inexpressible confidence in his love, an inexplicable peace in his will. It turns pain into joy, trial into triumph, sorrow into sanctity, and suffering into redemption. Gratitude gives thanks to God not because things are good, but because he is good. In gratitude, our wills become one with God's so that we bless him for the life he has given us and long for the day when he calls us home. Not 
my will, but yours be done. And so for all the good things that are to come, and all the heartaches too, O oh Lord, we give you thanks. To which blessing, Gratitude. from it's which blessing. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not some nostalgia you know or wistful so memory you of watch what has again. been. Or some nebulous. To which blessing, from which blessing. Today, that is the last part of our series on being blessed. I don't know about you, I've super enjoyed being here and just studying throughout the week about how to teach y'all on the qualities of blessed and how to be blessed. Don't you know we all want to be blessed, and yet a lot of us don't live a blessed life. So today, of course, I had to have the most complicated title, To Which Blessing, From Which Blessing. And here's the reason why this is the last part of our series. We all know that God is leading us into a blessing, right? But which blessing is that? Furthermore, to get into that blessing, which blessing do we need? It's a complex thing as a believer, but you and I live this life. Let me give you an example. Whether you're going through a storm or going to go through a storm or have been through a storm, you know that the storm is coming, what do I mean by a storm? The times in your life where you are wondering why God is letting this happen, yet as believers, as Christians, we know that He allows things to happen. And we believe that those things that He allows to happen are all turned into a blessing for those that love Him. We don't believe the blessings that God keeps us away from the storms, but that He blesses us through the storms. So we're headed into blessings from blessings. But here's where it gets complicated. We're going to be in Joshua 3 for a little bit today. I just want to read to you that. It'll be on the screen. It says, And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with a Levitical priest carrying it, then you, are, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. I find that so interesting, how here in this place, God is telling them, I'm going to lead you, by the way, the way that he led the Israelites through some of these biggest problems was through the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what's an ark, you might ask? Maybe you saw it in Indiana Jones. Well, the ark is simply a place where God rests, Right now, we believe that God rests in you and me through the Holy Spirit. Back in the day, the Holy Spirit wasn't in everyone. He was in an ark. And they would, they would have this ark guide them. So they would carry this ark of the covenant, the priests. They would carry it on front of them, and they would follow. And God is telling them at this moment that they are about to go through the Jordan River. Now, I'm going to give you a little background on this. So the Jordan is the place right before they get to Jericho. If you grew up in church, you would know that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. But to get to Jericho, to get to this blessing first that God was going to do, they had to get through the Jordan. The Jordan was a very strategic place. It was a river right before Jericho that was almost impossible to cross because of the tides. If you try to cross that with an army, you would end up drowning. Uh, your horses wouldn't make it. They would get swept away. It was a disaster. But God is about to do two miracles. See, we often remember the blessing he does when the walls of Jericho come falling down, but we forget about the Jordan that they came from. Of course, the interesting part being the end. Do not come near the ark that you may know the way by which you shall go for you have not passed this way before. I don't know about you. I often feel that way about my life. Sometimes it's scary to go forward into God's plan because I haven't been that way before. I think it's, it's such a good thing to take with us through life that during the times that we haven't been to somewhere before, maybe it's a new job, maybe it's a scary opportunity, maybe it's a place of forgiveness that you need to come to. Maybe it's something that's going on in the life of your church. I'll tell you a way that we have not passed by before that we're being led into. 
The other day I was at the gym and I was on the treadmill and uh, I was trying to walk, trying to get my time through, but I was also messaging friends. Now, something that I do on the treadmill, sometimes I listen to sermons. Other times I'm like listening to a podcast. Other times I'm thinking through my sermon points for the week. And one of the things that came to my mind as I was praying was just this joy. I don't know why. Maybe it was because I was on the treadmill. And I just got warmed up. But all of a sudden I got super excited. Like I just felt this joy in me. And I was, I was like, where is this coming from? I got excited because I was thinking about the place that God is taking us as life point. Now, let me tell you, the place that he's taking us as a church is often scary to me. Why? We haven't been there before. Maybe kids are scary to you because you haven't been there before and you've got these munchkins running around and you don't know what to do with them. Maybe you've got a problem in your life where the doctor's given you a new diagnosis and it's scary and, and you don't know how to get through it because you haven't been that way before. These are regular things. These are regular things. Now, for me, thinking through it as a pastor, I'm literally sitting there saying, God, lead your church, lead the place where you are resting in people. But how do we get there? How do we get to helping the city? How do we get to reaching them in the unique way that God has for us? It's a hard thing to understand. Have you ever known in your heart that God wanted you to move in a direction for a blessing, but you didn't know how God was going to accomplish it? Yeah, I think a lot of us live in that way. A lot of us live in that place. You know deep down in your heart that God has a plan for you, a mission for you, and you know God is going to accomplish that because that's what he says in his word. But how is he going to do that? Well, let's go on and read this again. He says, However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Let's pray. When we go into this prayer, we're going to be praying, asking God that although we're going into a place that we haven't been before, that he would lead us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for today that you're going to show us the blessing, one of the last blessings, one of the most ignored blessings, and how to know how to get through the place that we haven't been so we can get to the blessing that you have for us. I pray for everyone in the room today that you would show us through your passage how to look at yesterday and the future. In your name we pray. Amen. One of the most confusing parts about this passage is how God was going to lead them into something when God didn't want them to get very close. Oftentimes in life, we live in this place, I like to call it the middle or the in-between, where we know what God has planned for us, but we haven't gotten there. And it seems like, in a way, God is keeping us at a distance from knowing what he has planned. You want me to give you an example? Single people in the room. Wouldn't it be nice if God just pointed out a person and brought that person to you, the right person? Yeah, that would be awesome. Those of you looking for the right job or are in a stressful job, wouldn't it be just incredible if God would come and say, hey, no, 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 don't apply there, go here. It would be great, but God keeps us at a distance. And I think he keeps us at a distance because we haven't passed that way. And God knows if we knew the hurt we would go through to get there, some of us might reject that blessing. But let's see what God does because God leads them into a place. In verse 15, we skip ahead a little. It says, And then those who carried the ark came into the Jordan, which is a river. And the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of the harvest. And the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose in one heap, a great distance away at Adam, the city beside Zarathon. And those which were flowing down towards the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite Jericho. God does a miracle. During the time of harvest, the water was plentiful, but God stops it. A similar miracle to what he did through Moses, this time through a new leader. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. What does this show us? This shows us that God didn't just lead them into a place where he wanted them to stop. He went ahead of them and did a miracle by parting the Jordan. 
Why? So, they, so that way they could cross safely into a new conquest, into a new blessing. Now, you would think if they're on the way to war with Jericho to go to the promised land, which is where they were headed, they were headed to a promise, to a blessing towards that, that they would just continue marching. That God would say, okay, I did a miracle for you. You need to hurry up towards the blessing. A lot of us in our lives as Christians on our walk feel like when we get through a blessing, we should immediately get into another blessing. An example, you get the car you wanted. Next thing you know, you say, hey, maybe I should be blessed with a house I wanted. Hey, I have the wife I want. I have the spouse I want. I've got this godly person next to me. Hey, God bless us with children. And then you have a problem during pregnancy. You can't get pregnant. And you're saying, God, where are you? You gave me the spouse. Give me this other blessing. But sometimes God wants you to wait. In this instance, he does that. It says in Joshua chapter 4, Now, when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here and out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. A pretty strange request. Take these stones, go out, put them in the river, in the middle of it. So confusing. God, why why do you want me to go back to the thing you've taken me from to place the stone? Joshua could have easily have asked this. In fact, he could have probably just said, hey, you know what? Let's just praise God for this and head on our way. But he doesn't. It says, so Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded. So they say, okay, God, you're telling us to take the ark back there so you can split the water again so we can place these stones there. We don't know why you're taking us back into a blessing, that you brought us out of, but you are. And because of that, even though we're looking forward towards where you are taking us, we're going to look back and take a minute to honor you. Why? So that way when their children say, well, what's the use of this? Isn't this outdated? Why why did you place these stones here? Shouldn't you have moved on? They can say, it's because we praise God for what he has done. From which blessing to which blessing? They could have just walked past. The mission had something of an upcoming battle they could have prepared, but they took the purposeful time to put a symbol down, a symbol of the blessing of where he was taking him. Why? So that way they wouldn't forget. Now, this shows us something. God is commanding them to commemorate a place of a miracle so that they don't forget. Notice God doesn't let them really just figure it out. He tells them, go and do this. What if I were to tell you there is a blessing that God is telling you to look back at, and all of us as believers have this blessing, yet a majority of us, the statistics say about 40% of us as active Christians, don't do this at all. We don't even know what it means. That would be like looking back at the stones and asking people, what do those stones mean? And they say, we've forgotten when God did a miracle and separated the Jordan. Now, what is this, you might be asking? Well, we'll see in a little bit. First, I want to point us at what the 12 stones mean. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the 12, stone, the 12 stones point towards God's miracles, His graciousness, His forgiveness, His power and provision. But they also signify that the Israels were crossing into something greater, something not of their own ability. 
Oftentimes, when we forget about what God has done, what He has taken us away from, we doubt Him. Have you ever wondered in your life why God can bring you through so much stuff, and then when you encounter another storm, you're wondering, and you're asking God, where are you? I do this all the time. They say in most marriages, the reason why they fail in couples counseling is because they forget to be grateful for one another. In other words, people look back and they forget about why they fell in love to begin with. They look at the little things their spouse does day to day to help them out, to kind of show their love. And they don't notice that. All they see are the bad things happening, the stress happening. Oftentimes we can look and forget about what God is doing and only see what is ahead of us without seeing the blessing coming past that. Sometimes we had to take a second and look back at what God has done through a commemoration, through a ritual of what God has given us. Here is one of my favorite new quotes. If you need faith for tomorrow and what tomorrow brings, you don't have to look very far. Just look at what God did yesterday. Let me repeat that. If you need faith for tomorrow, look back at what God did yesterday. See, oftentimes we think with the storms in our past, we just need to keep looking forward and never look back. However, then we lose the significance of what God has brought us through. In my life, it looks like this. When I'm wondering if God has really a plan and a future for me, and all I see are the bad things and the stressful things, I look back and see that God has brought me from places way worse than that. There is a blessing that comes with the storm. But I have made in my own way a commemoration every day, every week, every month of what God has done for me in the past. And this is where the real blessing is found. But let's look at the importance of the 12 stones first. It's, it was symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. See, God had split them into different tribes in Israel, and Israel was the nation of God. It was the blessed people. And God had split them, and God was going to bless Israel through the tribes. Well, how, what does that mean for us as Gentiles? What does that mean for us who are under the, the love and graciousness of Jesus, the Son of God? Well, we had to look no further than the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples, 12 of them, in Matthew 14, it shows us a place where we can forget what God has done, even if we love Him. It doesn't mean you're not saved, but it keeps us away from a bigger blessing. None of us want to be kept away from a blessing. So let's see at what happened. Matthew 14, verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, that being Jesus. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. In other words, Jesus just gave one of the best messages of all time. And then his disciples go out to fish because they are fishermen. They need to get food. They need to get money. They need to provide for their families. So they go out there towards the ocean and a storm happens, a literal storm. That's where Christians get the saying a storm, by the way, if you're new to church. So a literal storm happens, and the disciples are out there without Jesus, without the miracle worker, without the Son of God. And they're a long way from land. They could drown. They could die. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes to them. Now, he doesn't row out to them. He comes to them by sea, by walking on the sea. Isn't that just like Jesus, right? He was like, oh, my people need my help. I used to see this as Jesus showing off. But I don't think it was that. I think Jesus saw his disciples in a desperate need, so he was going to do a miracle to get to them. And it wasn't showing off. He was going to do anything he could to reach them in their storm. I think you're the same way. I think God oftentimes goes a step further than what you would see as a relaxed God to bless you through the storm. And yet sometimes all you can see is the storm ahead of you, which is how, what we see through Peter. So uh, immediately when they see him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I love how um, ghosts don't exist, yet they see Jesus and they're like, oh, that must be a ghost. There's something walking on water. Like if Jesus could do miracles, I guess ghosts can exist too. And they are in fear fear of this. 
They are in fear of what they haven't seen before. Remember what we read in in the book of Joshua when he said, don't come close to the ark because you haven't been that way before? He was afraid of them being scared of the rushing waters In this area, we see the same thing. They see Jesus walking on the water, and because they haven't witnessed that blessing before, not only are they still scared of the storm, but they are scared of the blessing to come through Jesus himself. Oftentimes in storm, I see like new Christians and even strong Christians, depending on the size of the storm, say, God, do you even love me? Like, do you even exist if you're letting me go through this storm? Yet in this situation, they are doing the same thing when God is literally doing a miracle through that storm. He says to them, uh, Peter, so, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter says to him, one of his followers, one of his disciples, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Peter finds this as a pretty cool time to say, okay, let me walk out to you on the storm. Let me show you that I have faith. I think a lot of us in the room today are going through a storm, yet we have a love for Jesus and a faith for him. But yet we make mistakes. Let's see what happens. And so Jesus says, come to me. Jesus fully knowing well what was going to happen. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. This boggles my mind. He is literally walking on water. And then he sees the wind begin to pick up the waves. And he goes, I might sink. Brother, you are walking on water. (laughs) How many of us have been through something that God has brought us through? Almost as, as much of a miracle as us walking on water, almost to that point. And yet when another storm happens, when the winds begin to pick up, we go, oh, man, God's just going to let me sink. Yet we do that. But this passage gives us the tip, gives us the clue, gives us the key on how to get through these times without doubting. Let's see this. Seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretches out his hand and took hold of him. And Jesus says to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Peter didn't doubt that he could walk on water. He was walking on water. He doubted the Savior was going to save him. When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. I find this wild. If you go a few chapters back, you see Jesus healing people of diseases. You see Jesus helping paralytics walk. You see Jesus performing all these miracles, yet during the storm, they're afraid. During the storm, they're sinking. It's like, man, just go a few days before, guys, and see what God has done. Yet they forgot to look at the past, and all they could see was the storm on front of them. If you need faith for tomorrow, look at what God has done yesterday. That's what they should have done. When things are looking too deep in your life, When you don't know how God's going to get you through the storm, what you need to do is look at what God did yesterday. Remember the things that you were grateful for yesterday. Have you forgotten what God did yesterday? When we are ungrateful of what our parents do, our parents say, all right, when we don't remember what our parents have done for us that is good, our parents call us ungrateful. When my wife washes the dishes and I don't thank her for it, I am unthankful. And I know this because when I wash the dishes, I want to show it off to my wife. I'll sit by the sink. She'll come down from putting the kids to bed and I'll I'll be leaning over and I'll be like, pretty clean sink, huh? I remember one time, I guess because she does the dishes and often, you know, she does it every day, so it's not a big deal. And sometimes I forget to be grateful for that. Uh, One day she was like, nice, they needed to be done. I was like, man, that's pretty ungrateful. Forgetting the good that has happened 
is called being ungrateful. When you forget what happened yesterday, whether in your relationship with your spouse, whether you're in your relationship with God and the ways that God has blessed you, we would call that ungrateful. What is the opposite of ungrateful? Being grateful, being thankful for what God has done, which leads us into the blessing that I want to talk about today, tithing. I think the best way to remember what you're grateful for is to express gratitude, gratitude. Now, some call this worship, this gratitude, but worship can be done in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of us call worship singing. You come to church, you're saying, I'm showing God I'm grateful by worshiping Him, by singing. No, 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 that's not just worship. Worship is expressed through your gratitude of God. If you're singing out of gratitude, it is there. And that's giving towards the homeless, towards the poor. That is gratitude. That is worship. When Jesus, here's a crazy thing to think about. When Jesus was healing the people that needed to be healed, he was pointing glory and worship and gratitude towards God, even though he was God. When you are helping people in need, you are showing gratitude for what God has done for you. When you are forgiving those that have no right to be forgiven, you are showing gratitude towards God. And now, tithing is, is one of the ways of gratitude that is one of the best ways to create a memorial, a place that you can look at and thank God for what He has done. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, tithing is really tangible. You can feel it. You can hold it. Now, why are we talking about tithing, you might ask? Well, 40% of active Christians either can't explain what a tithe is or haven't heard about it. Now, this was built off of years of people saying, man, churches, they just care about money. They just care about money. All they care about is the tithe, this and that. But it's led us to a place where people don't even know about it, yet it is a biblical concept. What if I were to tell you I see many people in their lives who can't remember what God did for them yesterday because they're not being grateful for what God is doing today in a tangible way? Teaching about the tithe, to me, is not something I've never been scared of. I, I've known pastors I've worked for who were so scared to go and teach people about the tithe. But for me, as someone who tithes, as someone who feels the pain as I give the money, as someone who feels the joy, as someone who encounters the blessing of tithing, I see it as teaching about how to be blessed. How to be blessed. If I were to ignore talking about how to give back to God, I would be ignoring on telling you about a blessing that you could be receiving today. Now, what is that? Well, the stones in the story we read were a tangible way that they could look back at what God had done. It took sacrifice, commitment, and it took maybe standing still for a little bit to give back to God. So that way they could tell their children, this is what God has done. Now, tithing is the same way. If you need faith for tomorrow, look at yesterday at what God has done. Now, tithing gets a bad rap. It really does. We have a lot of people who are so scared to share the blessing that they won't even tell others about it. What if I were to tell you we have people in the room today who are the most generous givers who don't make a lot of money? Now, here are the stats on it. The stats are, believe it or not, you would think the people with the most money give the most. That's never how it works, ever. I don't know how. I think there's a, there's a foothold on wealth that Satan has oftentimes, where he says, if this person is successful, I can stop the blessing by making them selfish in a way and ungrateful. Oftentimes, we see people like in Scripture. Do you all remember the widow? There was a widow in Scripture. And these Pharisees, these religious leaders would go, and when they would drop in their tithe, they'd make sure everyone knew how much they were putting in it. And this widow, who didn't have a husband to provide for her, she went and put in a nickel. And they said, why are you only putting in a nickel? And Jesus looks at them, and he says, that to me is worth more than all your tithe. She is giving what she can give because she is grateful for what God has done in her life. She is grateful even though her husband has passed away. She is grateful even though people are mocking her. She is grateful even though she doesn't have the most wealth. And Jesus honors that. Jesus respects that. Now, tithing is birthed out of an attitude, right? Tithing is birthed out of a heart of gratitude for yesterday. But flourishes 
and an act of faith for tomorrow. I want to repeat that for you. Tithing is birthed out of, heart, out of a heart of gratitude for yesterday, but it flourishes into an act of faith for tomorrow. Tithing isn't going, yeah, you know, out of resentfulness, out of having to do it, I'm just going to give. No, the biggest tithers are people who go, hey, look, I'm going to give back to God because I'm so thankful for what he has done. Now, what does a tithe mean? You're saying, oh, that's great. I, I want to tithe. What does a tithe mean? A tithe, the word for it simply means a tenth. It means a tenth. A tenth of what? Well, a tenth of what God has given you. A tenth of what God is blessing you. A tenth. Now, where does this tenth come from? What is it about? Well, the first blessing of a tithe, it has three blessings. The first blessing of tithe is it gives us a way to express our faith in a tangible way. You know, there's often times where God asks us to do things, to take a step of faith, and it's not tangible, so it's hard for us. To take time out of your day and pray to Him is difficult. To pray that God does a miracle in your life is difficult. You can't see that. To pray that God uses your time and uses you and uses your storms in a powerful way to affect those around you, it can't really be seen at the moment. But giving can be seen. When you give to someone in need, when you give to the church to use it to spread the mission of God, you are saying, look, I'm going to put this money in here for you, God. And not only does it bring a happiness about you, but you see it go to work in an immediate way for the kingdom. Now, that's the first blessing of tithing, is it is one of the only things you can do that is a tangible way to honor God, right? The, the Bible tells us not to gossip. It, it tells us not to lust after others. It tells us not to be selfish. All these things, you can't really like just see them or do them. It all has to be built within you. Tithing is similar, except tithing is so tangible. Even if you first regret it, if you first feel pain, if you go and do it, you did it. It's kind of like going to the gym. You don't want to go to the gym. But when you go and do it, when you leave, you're like, man, I'm thankful for doing that. And it creates something about you to where you become more generous because you are thankful for what God has done. You can agree with me in this way as much as any others, that we all believe God has a plan for our lives, but we know it's only fulfilled through obedience in faith, through obedience in faith. The Bible tells us out of faith we give back to God, not because we couldn't use it on something else, but because we believe in what he is telling us can make a difference. This church wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the sacrifice of hundreds of people who have tithed. This church wouldn't be here if it didn't take a step of faith for leaders like me to say, hey, you know what? I don't want pay. I don't want any money. I just want to go and lead the mission of God. We wouldn't be here. But we took a step of faith out of obedience. We would all say that's what it takes to go further. But oftentimes in our money, we are held back. Now, here's the thing. As a church, we want to use the tithes, the things you have trusted with us, to reach our city. Now, what are these things? Well, like I said, we're going into a new phase of our church that we haven't seen before, so sometimes it scares me. But here's what it looks like. In some ways, it looks like something that will happen. In some ways, it looks like something that's difficult to get to because of our finances. But we want to do things, like maybe you haven't heard this, but we want to start a program here where we teach kids the scripture and schoolwork who are in pre-K and kindergarten. We want to do that. We want to provide time for mothers and fathers who are raising kids to come together as their kids are being watched and taught the Word of God throughout the week. Maybe so the mothers and fathers can go and grab a cup of coffee. We want to provide a place where when people come in need that are homeless, we can give them jobs. We can provide them and teach them how to make an income. We want to provide a place for people where they can come and just hang out and vent to people who are counseled in the Word of God. We want to reach our city with different, whether it's ads or whatnot, so that way they can hear about the love of Christ. One of the powerful things we're starting next month is a series on prayer. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to put everywhere on Facebook, everywhere on Instagram is an ad that says whether you're going through a storm, have been through a storm, or are going into a storm, we want to pray for you. Now, how do people see this? Because of the ads we put out there? Do we make a cent from it? No, we just want to pray for people. Isn't that awesome how God can use your money to influence people? 
Here's the thing. Back in the day, pastors used to go to gas stations, and they would sit there, and they would approach people. Hey, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? If I were to go and do that today, I would get kicked out. I would get arrested. You would see me on the news. Weirdo pastor approaching mom at a gas station. That's not what you want to see. Potential kidnapper. Keep a lookout for the guy that says, Yahweh, we heart you. Keep a lookout for him. He's a little suspicious. We're in a different era, but we want to reach people in a powerful way. And it can only be done through your faith. Guys, when I was on the treadmill the other day, I was thinking, and all I can see right now in my eyes is a church that's trying to find their place in the city. But God's going to expand us. He's going to expand and use you to do powerful things. There are going to be leaders he's going to raise up from here because of their faith in him. There's going to be areas, counseling areas that can help mothers who are thinking, should I have an abortion? Should I raise this kid? How can I do it? We'll be able to counsel them. We'll have places where people depressed, coming, looking for God, can find him. I mean, this makes me emotional, guys. Give a hand clap to God for what he's going to do. Out of faith, we are going to find what he has for us. He's going to use us. But we had to be a faithful people. Now, where do we see tithing in Scripture? You're going, Sydney, this is all great. I'm all for it. But where do we see this? Look, no, you don't have to look any further than Genesis, the first book of the Scripture. In Genesis, in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17, we read about Abraham. By the way, Abraham is the forefather of our faith. Meaning because he had faith in God, God was able to use him to multiply through many generations to where even though you and I are not related blood-wise to him, we are related because we have the same father in heaven. That's who we're related by. And he was the father of the faith. Now in verse 17, we see after Abraham returned from victory over Kedil Lormor and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava. This is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abraham some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. This is the tithe. He gave him a tithe, a tenth. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, another king that didn't worship God said, give back my people who were captured, but you may keep for yourself all the goods you have recovered. Abraham replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God, most high creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say I'm the one who made Abraham rich. What's he saying through this? Melchizedek is there, and he says, Melchizedek, I want to give you a tenth as a blessing. Melchizedek wasn't even involved in the war. And then the king of Sodom comes and says, hey, take what you want. He says, I'm not taking from you, and I'm not giving to you, for you're not from God. Now, who is this Melchizedek? Right? You might be saying to yourself, who is the tithe for? You said it was for God, but he's giving it to some king? What does that have to do with me as a believer? Well, in Hebrews 7, it explains to us who Melchizedek is. It says, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of the spoils, a tithe of the spoils. Now, who was this Melchizedek? First of all, by the translation of his name in Hebrew, he is king of righteousness. And then also, he is more than the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. Salem means shalom, which means peace. The king of righteousness, the king of peace. Melchizedek, isn't that God? Oh no, this is someone from an order of God. He goes on and says, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. What does this mean about Melchizedek? Was he Jesus? No, but he was a Christ type. He was someone that was a type of Christ. Some scholars would see him as an angelic being, but we know that he is a being that's both a priest and a king resembling God. It could have been a theophany. It could have been an angel. But we see that it is a part of who he is. 
Well, it goes on and says, And those indeed are the sons of Levi who receive the priest's office have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are the descendants of Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham. So in the Old Testament, they were commanded to give a tithe to the Levitical priests. But this guy was before the tithe. This Christ figure was before the Levites who came from Abraham's descendants. This was a Christ type. I want to skip a little, and I want to answer this question. A lot of us, as you want to begin, a lot of us, as we are giving money, you would tell yourself, you would say, hey, look, I would give money if Jesus asked me to give it, but I don't see Jesus asking me. I don't see it anywhere. If Jesus came to me and said today, hey, can you give me some money? I will give it to him. He's the son of God. He saved me. He's the savior. But a lot of us aren't doing that in our everyday lives. A lot of us are saying to ourselves, I want to give money to a church, but I give it to someone in need. I want to let you know this. When we tithe, we tithe to Jesus. The tithe was started to give back to someone who was a Christ type someone who resembled Christ, someone who had no beginning, no end. Some scholars think it was Christ before he came. Some others think it was an, an angelic being who Christ has sent as his representer to test Abraham about his faith. But what we know from this is that the blessing that comes from this is greater than we perceive. When you give towards Jesus, you do it by giving towards the church. Why? The Bible teaches us that the church is the bride of Christ. If you are telling yourself and lying to yourself, saying, well, I would give it to Jesus, but I don't trust the church. I would give it to someone in need, but I wouldn't trust the church. You are telling God, hey, look, I don't trust that, that the church is your bride. I don't trust you, Jesus, with that tithe. Now, this has been built off a lot of things. Sometimes churches have misused money. Sometimes churches have brought it to a different place. But as believers, we believe that the churches that follow Christ, that Christ holds them accountable. That God has created, Jesus has made sure that there is a righteous church, that there is a church that follows him through the Spirit. Whether that's by force or not, Jesus makes sure that that happens. We have faith in him that he does that. We have faith that we tithe to the righteous king and the king that brings peace. We tithe to Jesus. Now, here's the second blessing of the tithe. It takes our eyes off Egypt. Now, you might be asking yourself, when Abraham tithed and gave a tenth to Melchizedek, how did he even know to give a tenth? How did he even know to give back? Now, I have reason to believe that ever since the beginning, ever since the Garden of Eden, there was a tithe. You want me to explain this to you? Okay, God had given every tree in the garden to Adam and Eve, but he said, this tree, no, don't touch of it. That's mine. And what do they do? They go and they take it. They go and they say, no, God, we know better. We want to be in control. That is ours as well. Sometimes with our money, we're the same way. God has given you a job. No one would, no believer would say, God didn't give me that job. No believer would say, God didn't give me the money. Yeah, I went and worked for it, but God has blessed me with it. Yet then when it comes to our money, we go, yeah, you blessed me with every tree and you're telling me to give back this tree, but nah, that's mine too. See, Abraham observed from the Garden of Eden that there were some things that were for God. It's out of a gratefulness to God. It's not out of a command. It's not because God's saying, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to take your blessing away. No, God is saying, I'm giving you an opportunity of a blessing. When he told Joshua to go place the stones in the Jordan, he didn't say, if you don't do that, I'm not going to bring your people to the promised land. No, he said, this is for your children. This is for your legacy. This is for your future storms. So when you're going through a hard time, you can look back and remember the blessings that God has done. It's out of faith knowing that God's blessing rests on a person, not on a thing. See, in Genesis 12, Abraham was blessed by God. God tells him, you're going to have a great nation. Your descendants are going to multiply. He said, but the blessing's on you, not your things. 
He said, if, if you don't want to give back because you're worried about losing the money, because you're worried about those things, man, you don't realize the blessing isn't in your money. The blessing isn't on your great job, on your fantastic house that you're, oh no, the blessing is on you. God's going to bless you in or out of great finances. Whether our country or our economy goes down or up, the blessing is on you, not on those things. Abraham had this faith that if he gave back a tenth to God, it would bless him. It would bless him. Now, here's the problem. A lot of us in the room today have Egypt eyes. Egypt eyes. See, Abraham had been out of Egypt. As soon as God blessed him and said, the blessing's on you, a famine happened. And Abraham said, oh, the blessing's on me, but there's a famine. I'm going to run towards Egypt. Egypt represents a place of slavery, a place of bondage. See, some of you in the room today have a blessing, but God is trying to use your blessing to bless you. But you're saying, no, 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 God, you gave me that blessing, but I'm going to run to Egypt. I'm going to hide that blessing. So when he goes to Egypt, he is there and nothing good comes out of it. But God blesses him regardless. He almost loses his wife. He shows his fear, his cowardice, nothing like a leader, but God blesses him and brings him out of it. Now, something I didn't tell you because I wanted to keep it until this time is the reason why Abraham was in a battle to begin with where he gives a tent to Melchizedek is because his brother Lot had ran to a place like Egypt. See, Abraham and his brother were living together and so were their tribes. And God had blessed him and said, all this land, the promised land is yours. So Abraham went to the top and he said, we're having conflict a lot, but here's the thing. God has blessed us with all this. So you pick a place that you want to go. I want to read to you this passage. It's a powerful one. In chapter 13, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Lot looks up and he says, Abraham, you're telling me to pick a place. I'm going to pick the place that looks like Egypt. He has Egypt eyes. Now, here's the thing. The blessing wasn't on Lot. It was on Abraham. If Lot knew better, he would say, Egypt looks fine, but I'm going to follow the blessing. In my life, when it comes to money, it can be really difficult. It can be difficult to give. It can be difficult to have the heart that wants to give. I want to show you a little example of giving and how it works. This is how giving works. Some of us like to treat, it, treat giving like this. We'll go, oh, tithe, yeah, I want to tithe. I want the blessing of God. I have my, my salary, my paycheck. Okay, this needs to go towards bills. Right? More than one, right? It needs to go towards bills. This, uh, you know, we can go on a date night. That'll go towards date night. That's great. This, uh, you know, maybe my online subscriptions, maybe Netflix. I don't know, these kind of things I like to use. I have 20 left. Okay. I guess, you know, I can give this to God. Guys, that's not a tithe. That's a tip. That's a tip. We don't tip God. What we say to God is this. We go, God, you have blessed me with this. And I know if I give this money, I'm not going to get some magic return from it. But I want to place a tangible thing so I can look back at your blessing so I can remember, so my kids can see me do this. One of the most powerful things that happened to me as a kid when I would go to church is my mom would give me some money. She'd go, here's, here's, it wasn't 20, inflation, right? It wasn't a 20. But she would go, here's some money. I want you to put this in the plate. And the plate would come by me. And I would go, I was just given this money. I could use this for other things. But my mom told me to give it. I'm going to give it. I'm going to have faith and trust in her because she blessed me with it to begin with. As believers, I don't need my mom coming to tell me to give to God. I go, this is what he's given me. This is what's going in. All this is a blessing from God. I will use it. I could use that on other things, but I know God blessed me to begin with. I want that to be my blessing. I want to show him that I'm grateful for what he has done through these things. And it does a powerful thing through us. Not only does it take our eyes off of Egypt and take it off of the pride that we have, but it shows that our faith equates to the blessing I have received. 
I want to repeat that. Your faith should equate to the blessing you have received. This is what the tithe is. The tithe isn't saying, hey, I don't have money for my bills. I'm just going to take a bet and give all my money towards the church. No, it, it, you're not blessing the church. That's not how it works. A lot of people are afraid of tithe because we tell ourselves, man, I don't need to bless that church. I need that money myself. You're not blessing the church, man. God, God can do what he wants. You think he couldn't just send money if he wanted? That's just paper. God can bless with more than that. No, God is giving you a chance to put a memorial down to thank him, to be grateful towards him for what he has done. That is what God is doing through that. Now, how does this affect me personally? How does this affect LifePoint? Well, for LifePoint, if we want to go forward and help others, if we want to do all these great things, and I believe we have a unique blessing as LifePoint, let me tell you this, with all the churches around us, I would not have come here to pastor if I felt like we didn't meet a unique need. We do. We meet a unique need in our area, in our place. And we'll be talking about a lot about that next month. But here's the thing. When I come and I give back to God, not only am I saying, God, I'm taking my eyes off of Egypt. I'm being faithful. I'm being grateful. Gratitude is coming out of me from your blessings. So I'm going to be grateful and give back and be thankful but you get a seed in action, spreading the gospel. That is the power of that. Now, what does it do for you personally? The last passage I want to read. We're going to go to it. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. It says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purpose in his heart. You must give according to what God has told you in your heart, not grudgingly. If you come and say, man, I got to tithe, don't tithe. I'm not trying to coerce you into tithing. I'm trying to show you that you should be grateful and what God can do out of that gratitude. If, you're not, if, if you don't feel a gratitude towards God, don't tithe. Now, here's the thing. Here's the awesome thing that it says. When you tithe not grudgingly or under compulsion, God is loves that. It says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Man, I want to be thankful for God's love. This is one of the only places where it says, hey, if you do this, God loves you. God looks at cheerful givers and says, man, God loves everyone, but he looks at that and he is so, he's so happy about that. Why? Because God is giving. God has given us so much. In this passage, the context was there was the Christians in Jerusalem and they were being persecuted. And there was a church in Corinth and a church in Macedonia. And the church in Macedonia, although when they first heard they should give towards a cause, they were scared. But when they decided to, they did it. I think some of us in the room are like that today. We haven't heard of it. But now that we heard, we're going, you know what? I'm going to talk to my wife. I'm going to talk to my spouse about it. And then we're going to give. But then there was the Corinthians. That's like a lot of us. They knew they were supposed to give. And they said, yeah, we know we're supposed to give. But when the time came, they said, well, Egypt eyes. <laughs> they didn't want to give. And Paul says this. He says that God is able to make all grace abound in you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good need. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever, Jesus. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He's telling the Corinthians, don't be scared, be blessed. Show your gratitude towards God. He gave it to you to begin with. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. When you tithe, not only are you giving out of thanksgiving, but it's creating more thanksgiving in your heart. And it's contagious. It contagiously spreads. Here he goes and says that. He says, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing through many thanksgiving to God. As life point, when you give, not only is it going to the ministry of putting the people that we need and staff where we need them, can't do it alone. Of buying the stuff we need to put in here so that we new people can come in and say, yeah, this is a place of healing. This is a place of growth. I want to keep coming. 
but it overflows us with a generous spirit, not a stingy spirit. When I was young, I used to just love generous people. I would go to my friend's houses and their moms were so generous. Hey, you want food? You want more food? You want more food? Yes, please. I would hate going somewhere. Some people have generous grandmas. I didn't, ha- I had one that was generous, one that wasn't so much. I'll go to her house. You can't sit there. That's a new couch. You can't have that food. I just bought that. I don't like being there. As a church, we can't be like that. That's why we give coffee. That's why we give donuts. That's why we're the most, one of the most giving churches I know. Man, you want it? Take it. Hey, you want a chair? Go ahead, take it. <laughs> You're going to look silly taking that out the room. but <laughs> We want to be a church overflowing with gratitude. Thanksgiving multiplies. Now, here's the thing. Gratitude is the intake. Generosity is the output. Gratitude is the intake. Generosity is the output. Gratitude is saying, thank you, God, but I'm not just going to say it in speech. I'm going to be generous and let that be the output. I'm going to let him show that he is going to bless us through this. In verse 12, it says, For the ministry of service not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is overflowing through many thanksgiving to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession for the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to all of them. We see three blessings through this. The givers are enriched in the church. The receivers' needs are met. And God, the source of all blessing, is praised. Have you ever heard of old money? You wonder, well, that's great that it does that for the church. What does it do for me? Have you ever heard of old money? Uh, Old money is when your parents did something and they became rich. (laughs) A lot of hard work. And that money was inherited over to you. And people with old money, you can look back, there's even a term, right? And that's old money. It was worked for. It was gained. When you start tithing, your money becomes a testimony towards your legacy of faith in Christ. There is an old gratitude there. There is an old faith in that. You see generations, my father tied, his father tied. They've built many churches. My parents themselves, I remember growing up, they gave so much towards churches, building for the first time. I travel all throughout Texas City and League City and Lamarck, and I see these churches that they were a part of, that they built. So me, when I'm in a place where I feel like I'm going through a storm, where I don't know how I'm going to get through it, I look at the old faith that they've given me, at those stones they laid, at those times where they could have used the money for other things, but they gave it towards Christ. At the times where God blessed them with that raise in a job where, man, I remember we used to have to take water out of the bathtub and put it in the washer machine just to wash our clothes. My parents gave out of faith. And that built a faith in my heart. And I'm praying that you can have this blessing in your life, in your kid's life, that we would be a church that we can look back at when all of us are too old, when I'm too old to get out of bed, and I can say through faith, God built this ministry. That is who God is. Give him a clap. We pray for his blessing. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for the blessing you are putting in us, Father. I pray for everyone in the room today that they would look at that old faith And if they don't have that old faith through their parents and their parents, that they can start one right today, Father. That they can say, God, I'm tired of having Egypt eyes. I'm tired of thinking it's all about me. It's about you, Father. I'm going to take this time to look at the blessings that I've come out of, to look at the storms that you've pulled me through, and to put it back into who you are. To say, I give you a tenth. I will take my time and look back at yesterday and say, you are the God that brought me through yesterday. You are the God that will bring me through tomorrow. I'm so thankful. My graciousness flows out in generosity towards you. In your name we pray. Amen.
my soul.